someone some time ago said that marriage is a three-ring circus. You have the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. Uh, somebody else said, love is blind, but marriage is a real eye-opener. Uh, one man, uh, he was talking about uh, his marriage. He had some arguments and some complaints that had come up about his marriage. Uh, and he, he said, I asked my wife where she wanted to go for our anniversary. She said, somewhere I haven't been in a long time. So I suggested the kitchen. <laughs> he, he said, I, I, I married uh, Miss Wright. The only thing I didn't know that was that her first name was Always. Uh, he said, I haven't spoken to my wife in 18 months. I don't like to interrupt her. And he said, the last fight we had was my fault. My, ass, my wife asked, what is on TV? And I said, dust. Uh, however, uh, it's not only men who look at marriage and have difficulties. Uh, there, here's a story. A husband uh, was going through the house one day, and he found a box that had been hidden in his house. Uh, he opened it up, and to his surprise, uh, he found a little crocheted doll and $95,000 in cash. He went to his wife and asked his wife about this mysterious box. Uh, she said to him, Before we got married, my mother told me that the secret to a happy marriage was to never argue, that instead, if I ever got mad, I should keep quiet and crochet a doll. Her husband thought about it for a moment, and he was touched. In this box was only one doll, and they had been married for 60 years. And he just took a moment, and he, he thought, and he said, but, but what about all that money? He asked. And she said, oh, that's the money I made from selling the dolls. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes things are funny because they're true. <laughs> Uh, comedians uh, find a lot of good material uh, for their jokes uh, in this area of marriage and family. Uh, but in reality, so many of the issues that we face in marriage are not really a laughing matter. What we address in humor is actually a horror to so many people. And you may be here today, and you may be asking, are there really secrets to a happy marriage like the, uh, the lady with the doll suggested? And I want you to know this morning that there are answers. There, are, there is information about marriage and family that is good and helpful for us, and it is not hidden. The Scripture gives us the definitive word about marriage and family matters. And I want to introduce today the things that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. I would like for us to turn in our Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 3. And what I'm going to do is uh, I want to read the entire chapter uh, as well as chapter 4 verse 1 as we begin our time together this morning. Colossians 3 verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 
Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men." knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven." I know it's a lot to read uh, in uh, our time together this morning, but there is a lot of benefit at looking at this all together. Over the next few weeks, we are going to uh, talk about this idea of building families on the faith. So in the scripture, we find instructions about how family should be. And over the next few weeks, we are going to talk about some of these issues. We're going to talk about marriage, the roles and the responsibility of wives and husbands. We're going to talk about parenting, the duty of parents and children. And we are going to talk about work. Uh, When we do that, to give a modern understanding of the scripture, we're going to talk about the responsibilities of labor as a slave Uh, and the responsibility of management, uh, who would be our earthly masters. And so this morning, as we begin this conversation, we begin to look at what the Bible has to say about how to build our families on the faith. Uh, There are a few things that I would like to ask you to consider with me so that we might build our families on the faith that is described in the Scripture. In order to do that, I I feel like it's helpful. I think it's wise for us uh, that we, first of all, recognize the cultural influences that are around us. Uh, Whether you know it or not, your ideas about marriage have been shaped by the other marriages that you see. The the people that are around you, even the, the marriages that we watch on TV or in movies or Uh, And so our ideas about marriage have been shaped by culture. Uh, And as we dive into the scripture, it's my hope that we will gain awareness, we will grow in awareness of where our ideas about marriage and family have been more shaped by the culture around us than by the scripture. And so as we talk about these things, I hope that we will grow in biblical perspective about what marriage and parenting uh, and uh, even our relationships at work are all about. Uh, and so we, again, I hope we will come away from the scripture with an understanding of what the Bible has to say about these things and that we will build our families on faith more than the adaptations that mankind has made around us. 
in order to get an idea of some of the cultural influence around us, I think we need to take a look at the state of marriage today. If we're going to talk about marriage uh, and how the world views it and sees it, and of course marriage is going to have an impact on children, uh, it's going to have an impact on our, our work environment, it's going to have an impact on a lot of things. We need to see the, the state uh, of marriage in, in our world today. Uh, as we think about the, the marriages that we see around us and some of the problems that we might address, I, I want to suggest to you that the problems that we see is really the fruit uh, or the evidence uh, of decay in marriage. There, there are just a few things I, I want to, to talk about briefly. By no means is it a comprehensive list of all the things that, that might be going wrong with marriages in the world today. Uh, but I, I want to acknowledge some of the ones that are extremely prevalent and, and in our face uh, on a very regular basis. And the first thing that I, I want to mention just to, is in, as we look at the state of marriage uh, is the idea of divorce and the statistics uh, that we are surrounded, uh, that we hear. Uh, let, me, let me just do a quick poll, and you're welcome to respond to this. Uh, I, I feel like it's a fairly common uh, number that people know. Uh, today, uh, what is the percentage of people that end up getting divorced? Anybody got a guess? 50%. Okay, that's a pretty standard, pretty accepted percentage of people that end up getting divorced. Should that shock us? Should that be of concern to us that in our world, uh, in our culture, that this is what we find, that 50% of marriages end up in divorce? Uh, and I want to I kind of maybe expand on that even a little more, uh, that that statistic, 50% of marriages, uh, that applies to people who are getting married for the first time. People who get married two or three times, guess what? The percentage of people that end up getting divorced after being married two or three times goes up from there. On average, people that are married three times get divorced at the rate of 73%. I don't know if that's a shock to you. I don't know if that surprises you, but this is the state of marriage. Another thing that was concerning to me as I was looking into this uh, about divorce, uh, that there was an article on Forbes.com. Uh, you know, a, a fairly reputable, I guess, organization, you know, Forbes is something that would be well known. Uh, as I was looking into some of the, the modern, uh, newest statistics about marriage uh, and uh, Forbes.com, this is a, an article that was released this year, this uh, 2024. Uh, and it, some of these uh, statistics were based on studies done in 2021. So it's a fairly re uh, recent uh, study that has been done. Uh, one of the things in this Forbes.com article that I read said that among religious people, people who have any kind of spiritual belief system, any kind of faith, do you know what the, the, the religious sec uh, section of people or the people who claim to be religious, do you know who experiences divorce in the highest percentage. Now, I'm not talking denominations of Christianity. I'm talking about across the board, any spiritual belief whatsoever. All of the major world religions, all of the cults, all of the things that are out there. Do you know who ranks number one in divorce? Evangelical Protestant believers. Is that a shock to you? I would say it should be. It should be a shock to you that this is the, uh, the, the group that has the highest divorced population. We, we're not going to really get into all the reasons and why and things like that, but I, I'm bringing these things to mind just to say how prevalent it is uh, and just how much of an impact on our ideas about marriage that divorce has. 
uh, but not only divorce, but uh, we look around in our world, and do you know that uh, more and more people are, are delaying marriage? Uh, that they are, are waiting until they're older to get married than our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents did. Uh, the average age, uh, one of, one of the uh, statistics I was looking at actually through the uh, uscensus.gov, the official uh, government uh, website talking about the numbers that they process every 10 years when they do uh, the, the census, uh, they said that the average age uh, in, in uh, uh, now is somewhere around the age of 30 for a lot of men. It's a little younger for a lot of women. Uh, and that uh, so many people are waiting later in life to get married. And uh, is that wrong? Is there a problem with that? And, and maybe not necessarily uh, is there a problem with that. But one area that is problematic that among so many people who are waiting later to get married, they're actually living together before they get married. And so the percentage of people uh, who are uh, living, cohabitating, engaging in a, a, a sexually immoral lifestyle has increased along with these numbers of people who are delaying marriage until later in their adult life. And there's one third category that, I, that we uh, would do well to talk about, and that is this, that there are so many people that are denying marriage altogether now. Uh, they've looked at marriage, they've looked at divorce, they've looked at the problems and said, it's not for me, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and uh, over the last 20-something years, as if you look into to the statistics about divorce, uh, it actually shows, statistics actually show that there have been, has been an, uh, a decrease in divorce. And you might be tempted to be like, oh, good, well, we're heading in the right direction, aren't we? Uh, but not necessarily. As we, as we uh, look more into this statistic, do you know why there's less divorces? Because there's less people getting married. That, that, that so many people have written off marriage altogether, uh, that there is a decrease in the overall number of people getting married, and therefore a decrease in the overall number of divorces. And so it might not be a good reason that there are less divorces uh, because people have written off marriage completely, and they find themselves believing that it's just easier, better, or wiser not to get married in the first place. All of these things are... are, are involved in the culture that are around us. And these, these kind of help us understand the state of marriage in the world today. But it does not exist alone. We need to take a look at the state of marriage, but we also need to think about the shifting mentality that's around us. Uh, that uh, I, I don't think I need to tell you that if you were to go, uh, especially some of our younger folks, if you were to go and talk to your grandparents or great-grandparents about marriage, uh, even in the last 50 or 60, 70 years, there has been an incredible change in the beliefs about marriage and what marriage actually is just in the last uh, 50 to 70 years. Occasionally, at, when I'm at work at my hospice uh, job, I, I will have the opportunity to meet a couple who is in their 90s, and they tell me they've been married for 74 or 75 years. And I'm amazed. I'm like, wow, that is an accomplishment that is, should be honored. That is noteworthy that you have done that. And I, of course, I try and ask questions. Why? How have you made it this long? What, what has been a reason for your success in marriage? And you know, there's, there's different answers that are out there, uh, but I, it really comes down to this, that there was a, a foundational, a fundamental difference in the belief about what marriage was a generation or two ago than it, we find that is prevalent in our world today. Uh, and as we think about this shifting mentality that is around us, I, I want to, if, if uh, the divorce rate and the delay in marriage and, and denying marriage altogether is the, the fruit or just evidence of decay, then I would say that this shifting mentality is the root. This is the explanation of the decay that we see in marriage. Uh, as we think about the shifting mentality around us, uh, one, of the, one of the contributing factors to that is this, is that definitions are being redefined. 
Uh, we live in a world where masculinity, femininity, sexuality, and marriage are being redefined in our world. And the questions that we are faced with about gender and sexuality, they do contribute to the quandary that we find ourselves in wrestling about these issues of marriage. Some churches in our world today are taking action to confront uh, this departure from a biblical understanding of what marriage and the family is, and they are requiring their members to sign a commitment to biblical marriage. And I want you to listen to this statement uh, from First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. This is something they require of their membership. As a member of First Baptist Church, I believe that God creates people in His image as either male or female, and that this creation is a fixed matter of human biology, not individual choice. I believe marriage is instituted by God, not government, is between one man and one woman, and is the only context for sexual desire and expression. Now, if you'd like to look it up for yourself, I can give you the link. It's included in the sermon notes for those of you who have signed up to to get a copy of my sermon notes. And I'll be glad to to post it along with a a video where uh, First Baptist Church, as you can imagine, got a lot of flack from their community about their stand on biblical marriage. And so what did they do? They opened up their church and invited everybody from the community, anybody that had a question or complaint, to come and bring it. And this church is, is speaking the gospel in a patient and kind and loving way to their community. And it's an incredible video. You ought to watch it. It's going to take you about an hour and a half to do it. But, man, I don't know of a church that is engaging their community on these issues better than this church in Florida has done. And we find ourselves in a, in a place today where we as a church, we really need to uh, really look at the definitions that are going on around us about masculinity, femininity, sexuality, and marriage. And we need to be able to speak truthfully and honestly and with conviction that marriage was created by God and that it has been defined as the union of one man and one woman for one lifetime. Any understanding or definition of marriage that departs from this is an ungodly understanding of marriage and family. So not only are we dealing with definitions that are being redefined, but we are dealing with issues where roles are being rejected. Uh, that uh, do, do men and women have different roles to play in the marriage? Do we have different giftings by God that, that create a, a union that is strong and helpful and blessed by God? Uh, and we are seeing in our culture a rejection of the roles that God has outlined in the Scripture. And when I talk about this, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, who does the dishes and who cuts the grass. These are not biblical categories of masculinity or femininity. But what we find in our culture today, that there is a large segment of people who are rejecting God's structural design for the functioning of families. And we are going to talk more about that over the next few weeks. Uh, so we, we need to recognize the cultural influences that are around us. You cannot turn on the TV. You cannot watch a TV show that is on today without being faced with these issues, these questions, these challenges to biblical understanding of marriage. And I hope that you will have your eyes open to what is going on. In order to build families of faith, we not only need to recognize the cultural influence around us, uh, but we need to remember the context of Colossians chapter 3. So today I read the whole chapter, chapter 3, because uh, the things that we have been talking about over the last several months play a big role in our understanding of verses 18 on. 
that we cannot jump into the middle of the conversation. We cannot isolate a verse or a couple of verses out of the context of Scripture in order to begin talking about what marriage and family should be like. I guess husbands are guilty of this uh, in, in times where, you know, things aren't going right at home. And what do you want to do? You want to buy, pull out the Bible and you're going to read one verse of Scripture and you says, and it says, the Bible says wives should submit to their husbands and don't talk about anything else. Do we divorce the context immediately preceding it away from the verse? Or do we, do we see all of these things that we've been building up to, all these things we've been talking about, all of these things that we have dived deep and should try and understand, they're, they're not separate from marriage, but they're ingrained into what makes a marriage. So we, we, as we've gone through chapter 3, it's been kind of a general thing that we've been talking about all of these things, and we're going more specific. And so as we think about this idea of the context of chapter 3, uh, we really have to understand these things if we are really going to build our families on the faith. These preceding ideas are foundational. Do you want help having a right relationship in your family? Again, these are not secrets. This is what God has revealed. This is what God has told us in His Word. Here are the prerequisite, foundational ideas that you need to know and commit to if you want to have relationships that are right. As we go back, and I'm not going to re-preach all that we've done in chapter 3, uh, but I would bring to your, your memory to remind you of this, uh, that your redemption should af uh, affect all of your relationships. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. If we are looking at this as kind of a prerequisite understanding, a foundational component uh, for marriage, then we have to look at this and say, uh, that we, if we want to have right relationships, our redemption, our salvation should impact the way that we look at our marriage. Uh, it is absolutely essential uh, that if you want to have a harmonious home, you have got to have a heavenly mindset. If you do not come with a heavenly mindset, your home is not going to ultimately be harmonious. If you are doing the things that the Scripture talks about here in uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, if, you are, if you are living in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord, you're, it's going to show in your marriage. It's going to show in your family. And so we, we've talked about setting our minds on heavenly things and not earthly things. And that is a, a foundational component of, of having a harmonious uh, relationship with your spouse and your kids. Uh, we've talked about the importance of putting off corrupt, crooked, cruel hearts. In verses 5 through 9, it says that as a part of the family of faith, uh, in general, what we all need to be doing is trying to rid our lives of these things uh, that are ungodly, the corrupt, crooked, and cruel nature that is in our heart. Uh, where do marriage problems come from? Where do parenting problems come from? Where do problems come from in our relationships with people in church or at work? It comes from sinful desires in our heart that we need to make sure that we're getting rid of. Uh, and so we've got to, if we're thinking in the context of the family, it's absolutely essential that we're putting off this corrupt, crooked, cruel nature that we have, and that we will put on Christ-like care and compassion. Verses 10 through 17, it, it talks about and instead of doing these things that are controlled by the world and controlled by evil desires, it's, it gives us some, some words that should describe our relationships in our marriages, in our parenting, in our church, uh, even with the people that we work with, uh, that we, if we're going to put on Christ-like uh, uh, care and compassion, it's going to look like this. And so I would ask you to do some evaluation this morning. If you think about your marriage, if you think about your relationship with your kids, if you think about your relationship with other people around you, are these the words that describe your relationship to all of them, spouse, kids, parents, 
church uh, members uh, do these words. Describe it. Compassionate. Kind. Humble. Meek. Patient. Do you bear with and forgive? Do you strive for peace in relationships? Are you letting the Word dwell richly in you? Are you doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? All of these things that we've been talking about for months are prerequisite, foundational ideas that that should help us to build families of faith. That we do not just all of a sudden in verse 18, now we're on to something new and something different. We're going further. We're going diving deeper. We're making it more personal in our application of the Scripture. So all these things that we've been talking about in chapter 3 are necessary. They're needed in the world that we live in, in the relationships that we share with other people. But don't you really see how important this is for the people that are closest to you, that you spend the most time around, and honestly, the people that you sin against the most often? These are things we've got to to have in place in our life if we are going to have a harmonious home. We've got to have these heavenly mindsets. Now, uh, everything I've said so far this morning has has been an introduction. I know you're you're like, oh no, (laughs) Uh, how long are we going to be here today? Well, we're almost done. Uh, But I've said these things this morning by way of introduction to just talk about what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. It is absolutely essential for us as a church that we have an understanding of what it is to build families on the faith. And that's what we got to go after. That's what we've got to strive towards. That's what we've got to, to teach and encourage and even correct in the culture that we live in today. We need to build families of faith. And in order to build families of faith, there's one last consideration, and it's going to be what we spend our time on in the next few weeks, and it's this. We need to have regard for the rules of the Christian household. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to look down at your Bible. If you have it still open to Colossians chapter 3, Uh, Many of you will find that uh, before verse 18, uh, that there is a heading in your Bible. Uh, My Bible, uh, ESV, is what I I normally read and preach out of. Uh, The heading over verse 18 says, Rules for Christian Households. Rules for Christian Households. Now, there are other uh, headings that are out there. If you have an NIV, Uh, Some of the headings in the NIV will say something like instructions uh, for Christian households. Uh, And uh, you you may have other translations and they may say other things. Uh, And I do want to say headings over sections of Scripture are not inspired in the same way that the text of the Scripture is. uh, But we, and, and we do need to be careful how we understand what they say. Uh, but we, they do help us a lot by giving us an idea, an overview, or a summary of what is coming next in our Bibles. And so I just want to ha- you to have this on your mind today as you're thinking about the family and you're thinking about uh, th- these issues, uh, that we are diving into a portion of Scripture that really begin to lay out the rules or instructions for a family built on faith. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about these issues. I want to encourage you to be thinking about this, praying about this. Would you even be willing to say, Lord, would you show me the things I need to do in my family that I would grow in my understanding of of relating to my spouse, relating to my kids, relating to... Uh, my church or my coworkers, where you give me eyes to see places where I'm still driven by a corrupt, crooked, and cruel heart? And will you help me to have a heart that is more driven uh, by a desire to care and be compassionate like Christ uh, and to live in obedience to the things that are taught in Scripture? Do you know somebody that would benefit from hearing these rules or instructions about the Christian household? 
would you consider inviting them and saying, hey, uh, here's something we're going to be studying over the next few weeks, and I'd love for you to come and hear uh, what we're talking about and to begin a conversation with you about these ideas. Uh, these ideas are controversial in our world, and they are incredibly needed. And so as I, I lay these things out this morning, I want to challenge you uh, to be asking these questions, to be reflecting on these things, to have an open heart to the things that the Lord would say, an open mind to allow yourself to honestly evaluate, have, have my ideas about marriage and family been driven more by the culture that's around me or even my own family's personal history than they are driven by the clear teaching of Scripture. And as we move forward, uh, we're going to to look at, at Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to make a reference and mention uh, to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, and we're going to look at uh, 2 Peter, and we're going to uh, talk about some other passages that address these issues. So I would like for us today to go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we finish up our time of looking into the Word this morning. God, we do thank you for your Word, and Lord, the things that it teaches us about all the things that we need for life and godliness. Lord, one of the areas I know that we need the most help and the most understanding in is this area of marriage and family and, Lord, how we relate to those that are closest to us. God, I pray that you would give us eyes that would see wonderful things that you have laid out in your word for us. God, I pray that we would not only have a knowledge of what is there, but, Lord, that we would uh, seek to live these things out in a way that, Lord, uh, brings you honor and glory and, Lord, that is ultimately good for our family. God, I pray that you would help us to build families of faith. And, God, we pray your blessings on this. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.